series. And so I'm very excited to have our cat panelists today. It's another chiller day in Cape Town, so let's keep warm over this lunch. We'll be together for the next hour. Of course, the VNA Learning Lunch series has covered a range of topics from e-commerce and digital marketing to readying your business for online sales and support. In today's webinar, we'll take a wider lens and explore the current macroeconomic trends affecting the operations of FCMMEs and the opportunities arising in this context. We have a fantastic panel of many wonderful guests and who will be sharing their range of expertise. We'll dive into some important topics for you, the future of the tourism industry, how businesses are adapting and forecasting for the future. So we are joined by PwC's Chief Economist, Lulu Krugel, David Green, CEO of the VNA Waterfront, and Tim Harris, CEO at Westgrow. My name is Nwabi Samayama, and I'm the Partnerships Director at the Branson Center of Entrepreneurship. Let me tell you a little bit more about our panelists. Lulu Krugel is the Chief Economist for PwC in South Africa and a regular economic commentator in the South African and international media. She has 17 years extensive economic experience, primarily in economic modeling techniques, such as econo economy-wide modeling with micro, economic and macro environments. David Green is the CEO of the VNA Waterfront and has been there since 2009. He's overseeing increased visitor numbers, consistent commercial growth, and substantial investment into the infrastructure of the precinct, notably the building of the Zeitz Mokka. Green is also the chair of the Two Oceans Aquarium, director of Western Cape Development Board, Westgrove, and a member and chairperson in the Western Cape of the World Travel and Tourism Council, which is the WTTC. Tim Harris is the CEO of, C of Westgrove, the tourism, trade and investment promotion agency for Cape Town and the Western Cape. Tim previously served as member of parliament and shadow minister of finance for the Democratic Alliance. He holds a BA in English literature and a master's in economics from the University of Cape Town. Tim currently sits on the board of the Cape Town Film Studios and BPSA. Of course, for those of you joining us who'd like to engage in this conversation online and with us, you can share your comments and your views on social media using at VNA Waterfront, hashtag VA Learning Lunches. You can also make sure that you can post your questions in the Q&A box in this Zoom lecture in webinar to allow for our guests to be able to answer questions and to make sure that I'm able to make sure that those questions are posed to the guests as well. Of course, enjoy yourselves and I'll make sure that I'll also open the, the panel for discussions and for Q&A. Let's get straight into it. Lulu, I'm going to start with you. So now we've gone into level two lockdown restrictions and we're seeing slow signs of recovery. But from an economic point of view, where are actually, where are we right now? Thanks, Nwabisa, and uh, it's lovely to join all of you this afternoon. So as you said, I think we were all waiting for the economy to at least open up more. And definitely, as we've seen the economy open up more, we've seen some positive trends in some of the data that's been coming through about uh, renewed economic activity. But I do think uh, we should realize that the impact on the economy has been severe, and we expect the economy to contract anywhere between 8 and 10% this year. And certain sectors in particular, like tourism and uh, certain parts of the manufacturing industry, still feeling uh, the pressure, definitely. So we're not out of the woods yet, and it will probably take around two to three years for us to kind of get back to the same level of output that we had before all of this. In fact, I read a very interesting article the other day um, in The Economist where they're talking about a 90% economy. And, and what they mean there is that there's about 10% of our global economic activity that even if the economy is opened up, uh, will take some time to recover. And it's simply because we don't know what human behavior will, will, will look like. You know, will people um, start to, to return to their normal activities? Will they go out to restaurants like normal? Um, will they start to travel like normal? And we think it will take some time, unfortunately, for that uh, to, to return to normal levels. But um, I think we, we're glad that uh, they, we've moved to level two and some of those restric restrictions have um, has actually been lifted. And if we compare um, the impact on economic activity and output, let's say of level five versus level two, 
Under level five, we were talking about a contraction of in the region of uh, almost 40%. So about 40% of the economic activity and output not happening uh, like normal. And under level two, um, it's much less severe. We think the impact still still significant, but probably in the region of about a, a 15 to 20%. And uh, what, we, what we are looking out for is, is two important things. The one is the return of consumer confidence. Um, and in that, I almost want to say, you know, that includes tourists as well. And then on the other side, uh, the return to, to, uh, of business confidence. And those two things um, will, will play an important role as to how quickly the economy will recover to normal levels. Sure, I mean, the numbers are staggering. I'm going to ask a very difficult question in terms of looking at this very misty crystal ball. How long would you think it will be before South Africa's sort of economy returns to this 90% economy that you talk about? Yeah, I think if we, uh, if we need to be honest with each other, um, you know, we think anywhere between two to three years before our output in terms of the GDP numbers will return to normal levels um, in terms of the real impact. But I'm hoping that around, um, specifically if you look at the tourism industry, um, around December, hopefully we will see some, at least for, for, you know, for our local markets and, and local travel, etc. South Africans returning to, to more normal levels of, of activity. But I think we need to realize that, you know, for international tourists and for our own travel internationally, it will probably it will probably take some time. I think if we look at what's happening in Europe um, and, and what what tourists have been doing there, um, you know, you, you saw um, a lot of intercontinental travel, I suppose, you know, Europeans going to other European destinations. We have uh, German friends that come here every year. And they didn't do this year. Um, they, you know, during their summer summer holidays, um, they they had to stay in Europe, obviously, because we we didn't allow visitors in. But I also think people are a little bit more careful. They're probably, um, you know, looking at traveling by car more than plane, uh, trying to avoid the long distance travel, etc. And and for our uh, tourism industry, we will have to figure out how do we. How do we benefit from that? How do we benefit from that shift uh, in markets? You know, maybe, you know, focusing more on, on South Africa and our own local tourists. Um, and uh, I think we, it's difficult because it's not something that we've dealt with before to the same extent, you know, in, in this interconnected world that we're living at, in. And it's been a, a global impact. It's not like something like 9-11 like where we've seen, you know, once off event and it scared people off for a bit, but it was very localized. So this is widespread, and I think um, I'm pretty sure Tim and David would have some insights in terms of what the tourism industry is doing in in in, um, in the Western Cape in particular and in Cape Town. Uh, but I think for for a bit, our focus would probably more be on local tourists because I think that's where a lot of our demand um, in the foreseeable future will come from. Great, which is actually a really good, great moment for me to bring Tim into the conversation. So Tim, Westgrove has been particularly successful in its air access program. And now we're seeing that being replicated countrywide as part of the National Tourism Recovery Strategy. Talk to us about where we are and what is happening from a tourism point of view. What are the key pillars of these strategies at national and regional level, considering that the tourism sector has arguably been one of the sectors that have been most devastated by the impact of COVID-19? Yeah, and Robbie, it's a great question. And actually, in answering it, I want to go back to before the crisis. If you'll just grant me a moment to reflect on how well we were doing, because I think it's an important aspiration for where uh, we can get back to and, and an indication of the momentum that is possible here. So if you just look at the uh, 2019 um, tourism numbers against 2018, so the year-on-year -year performance for the Western Cape, International arrivals in, in that year were 16% up year on year. That means we went over 2 million international arrivals in the Cape for the first time. Bed nights spent in the Cape were up 10% to 26 million. And direct spend was up almost 50%. So just huge uh, spending uh, impact from the, the international visitors that we, that we had here. They, they spent in the year about 24 billion Rand. Um, and that's, that was partly driven 
by the connectivity that you spoke about and the fact that we, we had successfully up until that point doubled the number of nonstop international connections, including to really important markets uh, like the, the USA, where we uh, welcomed United Airlines flying nonstop for the first time. <clears throat> and interestingly, the, the momentum around landing new flights actually continued right into the early phases of lockdown. We, we, we announced during the lockdown that uh, TAP, the Portuguese carrier, was coming uh, from Lisbon to Cape Town and uh, that Delta Airlines will be flying Atlanta Cape Town. This was happening during lockdown. So. I guess it's important for us to remind ourselves just how well we were performing before COVID, okay? Because I think we can get back there. That's the that's the point. Um, as Lily said, unfortunately, the lockdown has uh, affected tourism um, right from the beginning until now, particularly international tourism. That uh, said, uh, the the degree of relaxation around, firstly, inter intra-provincial travel, so citizens, citizens in the Western Cape enjoying experiences in the Western Cape, and, and now most recently, as of a week ago, inter-provincial travel, so being able to market the Western Cape to Gauteng and the other provinces, that, that relaxation has happened quicker than I think we were anticipating. So that's because of a joined up lobby that's happened at national level, where the industry, South African tourism, and even the tourism minister have been extremely aligned on making the case for tourism as a key part of our economy, and particularly reassuring around safe reopening of tourism. So safety protocols, uh, and then I'm, I'm sure David will, will speak uh, about something like the World Travel and Tourism Council certification, which is a really important part of um, assuring travelers that, that we can be open and safe. And all of those things in Mwabisa, I think, position us uh, for another strong lobby around opening international travel. That, that, that is now what's happening. Uh, and if we're really going to save particularly small businesses in the Cape, we're going to have to get safe reopening of international travel as soon as possible. Right, right. And so what opportunities can you perhaps foresee for SMMEs in this context, in the tourism sector, from your point of view as Westgro? Yeah, look, I mean, SMEs in general uh, through COVID have all <clears throat> been forced, like every business, to, to really consider questions of a digital transition. And I think the, the tourism-focused SMEs are no different. Um, the, the, big, the big difference is most other businesses have managed to keep some elements of their business going through, through lockdown and have benefited from the relaxing over the last few months. Of course, if you have an SME that's entirely focused on international tourism, you just you just haven't been operating. So many of them have uh, adopted the digital uh, transition in terms of their marketing channels or prepared themselves for that. Uh, an, an example would be even something as kind of high touch as a tour guide. Um, you know, it's hard to think of a group that's more negatively impacted by a lockdown on international travel, but we, we spent a lot of time aligning our destination marketing efforts in the crisis with the ability of tour guides to turn their offering into a digital offering. So we, we ran a one day campaign, we called it where we were, we were asking travelers to plan for the one day they could return to the Cape. And that campaign was powered by tour guides across the Western Cape who were, who were leading digital tours of their destination on, on YouTube. Uh, that was a commercial arrangement. They got some much needed income during the lockdown, but more importantly, they were taking a very physical high touch service and turning it into a digital offering. Uh, and I think that is perhaps a, 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 just one example of where small businesses have have rethought their models in the crisis. I think that the, the digital marketing of, marketing of tourism SMEs will become much more important in the future. Uh, and hopefully, once we successfully safely reopen international tourism, you're going to see a lot of those SMEs having start to, started to rebuild, focusing on the domestic market, really offering an enhanced service to international travelers, hopefully as soon as this, uh, this summer season. Fantastic. So David, this is a great opportunity for us, you know, to bring you into this conversation, realizing that the VNA waterfront is Africa's number one most visited attraction. We've obviously heard Lulu talking to us about the economic outlook, 
Tim is talking to us about where we were as a tourism industry and where and where we can be if we work hard enough. How has this affected the VNA waterfront and how do you see the next few months playing out for the VNA waterfront? Mm, thanks, Dr. Bisa. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the waterfront is is the premier tourism destination in, in Africa. Um, but it is the premier tourism destination in Africa because we're a platform um, for the best of, um, of, of local craft design and food. And, and, and these areas in particular, are um, they're heavily supported by SMMEs. We've, we've probably got about 420 SMMEs um, and they are kind of focused on the craft design um, and, and, and food side. So we, they've been quite badly hit. I would say that the waterfront is probably more dependent on international travel and tourism um, than, than many. And I think it's probably worth saying at this stage, really um, the value of um, tourism within South Africa is, is predominantly in the international, so far as in the, in the international, almost 80% of, of the value is there. So while, you know, at this stage, we, we we're looking to survival um, and ideas. What is essential is the return of international tourism. Um, I think you know the, the big question is when is that going to come come back? And, and the truth is nobody nobody actually knows. Um, there's lots of predictions. So I think people have to um, kind of look at the predictions, but actually they're only predictions. The only thing we can look at is historically, um, international tourism travel has come back quickly. Picking up on a point Tim made, um, we have a fantastic offer here. Um, and what, from the surveys we've been looking at, the demand to come back um, in international tourism is, is high. It will come back in a phased way. Surveys are saying a lot of people, friends and family, want to visit relatives, but if they have property here, they'll be the first back in, then younger people, and then ultimately the, what, what you might regard as, as kind of um, first time tourism. But, I think what we've been trying to focus on is how do we look after um, the SMMEs that are strategic to this business and what initiatives can we put in place, literally so that they can, they can survive. And, and these initiatives start with rent relief, but then we went further to say, let's create a, a sort of support hub to try and bring, because it's quite daunting if you're a small business, quite daunting to look at all the different assistance and aid and, and ways forward. So we created this support hub we then um, created a, a help desk, so sort of one-on-one -on -one advice. And so far we've been advising about 80 of the tenants. Now, of those 80, 80% um, are saying that they are, um, they are required, they de they're dependent on international tourism. Um, so we've, we've been working on that. I think at the other level, what's been very successful, and you alluded to um, talking with Tim, um, one of the successes has been putting tourism on the map within South Africa. It's actually quite um, encouraging that um, senior government ministers probably wouldn't have talked about tourism, but now when we talk about opening the economy again, um, what you're hearing, people are talking about the 600,000 jobs, and, and what I found incredible just the other week was one um, informed minister who was talking about the economy actually talked about tourism before mining. I mean, can you imagine that mind shift? I mean, you know, South Africa is mining. So we've, we've got that mind shift. And, and the initiatives that particularly Westgro has been working on is to ensure that we're doing everything possible to get it open as, as soon as possible. Air access is a fantastic one because what it means is we have a line into the airlines, obviously in, in the interest of the airlines to open quickly, but we are trying to get um, Cape Town, um, South Africa, the province, first in the queue to, to, to be opening up in there. Um, and, and then it is, it is recognizing the international tourism as a market, so we have to set our standards very high. Uh, the, Tim alluded to the World Travel and Tourism. So World Travel and Tourism is, a, is the private industry body. All the major tourism players are in it, and what they've done is they've set up a, a scheme of international profiles, because basically this is going to open up when people feel safe to travel and they're comfortable with the protocols in place. So um, working with them, they've established those protocols, and we've been um, trying to make sure that we're first to establish that we have these kind of safety credentials that are going to give people some sort of uh, reassurance and, and open back up. But uh, as I say, I think that the goal and the prize is international tourism, that all the ingredients are there. There are some things under our control that we can do to try and influence to bring it back in. But in the interim, um, it is going to be about survival. 
and the local tourism is something that's going to come on stream sooner. I think um, we were certainly surprised how quickly the interprovincial tourism came back on. And, uh, and it is a case of trying to adapt and, and grasp that and, 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 and get some opportunity there. Um, surveys are definitely showing that there's quite a big pent up demand. Um, and of course, you know, you combine that demand, people from KZN, from Gauteng wanted to come down to the province, you combine that demand with their inability to travel internationally it means that we should be looking at quite a big lead up and, and then a very strong season. That's, that's really, really encouraging. And I mean, Tim had also alluded to the certification that the v Waterfront um, has now received from the council. And if, I think that speaks to Lulu's point around, you know, you've got to have business confidence, but you've got to have um, consumer confidence at play as well so that people feel safe. So can you explain and describe to us a little bit more around what the certification means and what it takes to be able to award certification and of course, how that impacts, you know, the, the likelihood of the VNA Waterfront being this platform that supports, you know, the survival of our SMEs and our tourism sector. Yeah. So look, as, as you'd imagine, it, it starts with the kind of basic protocols, which I think, you know, one of the things about this, this virus is that things change rapidly, but what hasn't changed from the outset is the you know, hand sanitizing, um, wearing a face mask and, and keeping social distance. But it kind of it goes beyond that. It sets high standards and it sets standards that people need to continually be looking at research um, and looking at what other sort of more innovative measures um, are, are in place. So in, in our example, um, you know, we, we understand um, a little bit more about the virus. We understand that ultraviolet is a way which actually kills the virus. So we've been looking at um, experimenting with the use of ultraviolet um, on things like uh, moving handrails. We've been looking at moving to completely touchless, um, to the extent that it is touchless parking things. We've been looking at nanotechnology, um, coating technology. There's certain um, very, very fine coating that you can uh, put on surfaces that people do have to touch, which actually have been scientifically proven to destroy the virus. So I think it's saying, let's share information, let's look at the highest international standards and, and keep experimenting um, so it's setting a base level standard that is a given, but actually going beyond that and researching that and looking at more innovative uh, approaches to it. And that, I think, is what's going to give the consumer the, the confidence that, that you are, um, you know, you're leading it, not just um, complying with the basics, you're going beyond the extra mile so they can get that reassurance. Well, that's really, really encouraging. And I think it's, it's interesting for us as well at the Branson Centre, where we talk about businesses for the future. And so this is what it sounds like. We're starting to, you know, almost drive a leapfrog of businesses that maybe were not participating in the economy in terms of new technology, new insights, new knowledge that will actually support us during, you know, the recovery period. Yeah. So Luke, I'm going to come back to you. So we're looking at tourism specifically in this, you know, conversation, but, you know, from your point of view as a chief economist who has a macro picture of what's going on in the economy. What are the sectors are you seeing that are, you know, ready to be, you know, recover more immediately than other sectors? And of course, which are the ones that you think will probably take a little bit longer to get to where we want to be? And I love this idea of this 90% economy because it's starting to talk about the new normals. Now, things are not going to look the way they do right now, but we'll get to an approximation of what we knew. But yeah, so I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts around that? Um, Wabisa, I... I think it's very interesting to see which sectors have been less impacted by COVID. And yeah, unfortunately, and I want to uh, just hook on to what David said earlier, just before all of this happened, we did some intense and, and very detailed research around where South Africa's growth should be in future and which sectors should we be looking at. And tourism came out number one in terms of bang for our bucks. So obviously, you know, if you look at, sorry, the GDP, potential GDP impact, job creation impact, etc. cetera. Um, we, we really back tourism to be that industry. So it's, it's really unfortunate what has happened. And, and that, that was the one industry that, you know, we, where we as a, as a country could, could um, you know, catapult ourselves from, and that's now been negatively impacted. But I suppose, you know, everybody's been dealt the same hand. So now we, we need to work with what we have. So um, two industries actually stand out, well, I want to say three in terms of where where we think um, the the growth uh, could come from first of all uh, food and agro processing and I think that's something that's important for the Western Cape as well um, you know given the role of agriculture um, unfortunately 
you know, there's been the impact on the wine industry over the last couple of months as well. But hopefully, again, that pent up demand will now will now uh, come back. But yeah, food agro processing. We've spoken to quite a few players in that market, and and they've actually seen in some areas um, an increase in demand. Uh, you know, as people cook more from home, um, do you know, and 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 buy bulk in terms of groceries, etc. So a lot of the food manufacturers have been saying, listen, um, we've, we've actually seen a bit of an uptick in, in demand. There's a lot of people channeled their, their expenditure there. And as such, uh, we're saying that agro-processing should be one of the areas that we, that we should back. It's interesting, even the German economy where, you know, you wouldn't typically associate food manufacturing and food processing with Germany. It's also one of the industries that they are backing. So, um, we, we should really think how we can continue boosting agriculture and, and uh, you know, improve um, our agro-processing capabilities and, and, and actually look at, at increasing our exports in those industries. Then the other interesting one is mining. Uh, mining has seen a less significant impact if you look at COVID. And again, we've spoken to quite a few players in the mining industry and they said, well, obviously, you know, um, they, they are not able to produce at full capacity yet because of social distancing and all the other things that they needed to, to, um, to actually look at. But relative to the rest of the economy, uh, mining has come out of it uh, a little bit better. Um, and unfortunately, as a country over the last couple of years, we've just not gotten the bang for our buck from mining. So um, I think that's some of the conversations and, and, and as PwC, we've been very involved with Business for South Africa as well. And, and myself and my team have done a lot of that research and we've got, gone to government and said, listen, here's an industry that has underperformed in terms of what it can actually contribute to the economy. Uh, but it's also an industry that's less impacted by COVID. So how are we going to support this industry to actually uh, be, a, be a basis of growth? And then the last one is, is trade. Um, and I suppose, you know, retail and wholesale trade, um, massive contributor to job creation in the economy. And uh, we also do believe, again, it's going to be in, in particular pockets probably that you'll see, you know, um, the demand uh, picking up and some pent up demand, but again, that is that is one of the sectors where we think uh, potentially, um, you know, they they could be they could be um, it could form a basis of our recovery. And it's very interesting when Tim spoke about you know what the tour guides are doing. It's amazing how innovative people are, and you know if you look at online trade and sales, it's absolutely boomed in South Africa over the last uh, couple of of, of months. And uh, it was only about 5% of our total, total trade in the past. And I think that's going to change. So the question is, how do we adapt to that? And if we think about bricks and mortar, uh, you know, type of retail, um, what does that mean for that, for, for bricks and mortar retail? And how do we find that balance um, of getting people to, to still continue to use both, both channels? So, yeah, I would say those for me are the industries where, where we could see a bit of a bounce. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because I think you, you've, you're highlighting industries that, of course, are labor intensive, which need people to drive them, which I think is really important for job creation, which in itself is, you know, a challenge that we face in South Africa. And at the same time, you're also talking about industries that have sort of an export, you know, dimension to them. And so, Tim, you know, when we were, you know, we've been talking to our entrepreneurs and our tenants for the last couple of weeks, and there's been a huge appetite in terms of understanding more around export as an avenue for business growth. Do you think that's still a good avenue in terms of our entrepreneurs, the tenants at the VNA Waterfront, looking at export as an avenue for growing their businesses, for recovery, and of course, for survival in a post-COVID world, whenever that will be? Yeah, without doubt, Mabi said the, the the association with Westgrow is normally one of uh, investment promotion because um, investment promotion always ratchets up big numbers every year, and people want to know what investment is coming into the Cape. But actually, a team that makes as much, if not more, impact at Westgrow is actually the export promotion team. They normally do about forty export missions per year uh, into market, where they're taking our companies and helping to facilitate uh, more sales. They, they themselves had to pivot to uh, 
Zoom missions. We've done now multiple Zoom missions across Africa and the rest of the world where we're, where we're setting up those um, sales meetings in, on a virtual platform. And it's been surprisingly effective, that digital transition that we've made. But it underlines uh, the a point that Lulu just made around the resilience of our agricultural and, and food sector. Um, I, I'm surprised by how well our supply chains stood up under the pressure of lockdown. There were obviously some issues around the port, but notwithstanding those, we had a, a really strong food and agri export performance over the last six months. Um, and we we look forward to to that growth continuing just facilitated digitally rather than in face-to-face -face meetings. It's also important to, to emphasize our major market in that space, which is the rest of Africa. Five years ago, we sold more product to Europe than anywhere else. But since then, uh, the rest of Africa has taken over and, and is now significantly uh, uh, bigger as a buyer of Western Cape product. So clearly that kind of neighborhood effect being part of this a uh, growing continent with the demography of Africa is a major uh, long-term opportunity. The other thing to do is to look at exports um, in a kind of uh, unconventional way. So look firstly at services exports. People think of export as a physical product, but actually if you're providing a call center or business process outsourcing services, you're effectively exporting those services. Many of our tech companies also export um, services and, and even tourism is in fact a, a form of, of, of services exports. And to, to Lulu's list, I would add certainly BPO, the broader digital economy and, and tourism as, as big growth sectors for the Cape in COVID and after COVID. And, and I think in COVID is important because while the world is operating with these new, within this environment, we've seen extraordinary growth in the number of call center seats in Cape Town because what, it, what we're doing is supporting uh, digital servicing using our skills here in the Cape. We've seen growth of some uh, tech companies. We, we are the, the digital hub of Africa. We've got about 40,000 tech jobs across 450 firms here in the Cape. And what's interesting is when you look at the continent, that's more than Nairobi and Lagos combined, for example. So we clearly are the leader in as a tech hub, which when the world is going digital means we're positioned for growth. And even although tourism has, has had a sudden stop, even tourism as the skies open up, I think the Western Cape offer is very well positioned for a kind of COVID economy and post-COVID economy. People will be looking for more wide open spaces. They'll be looking for a combination of, of kind of um, r relatively, let's say, undeveloped uh, wild experiences with credible infrastructure, you know, credible, a, 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 a credible airline network, a well-run airports, uh, uh, credible hotels that, that uh, comply with safety protocols. And we provide that combination of both of those, uh, a, a, a province that is um, personified by wide open spaces and space and, and the opposite of over tourism, but with highly credible tourism infrastructure. And, and I think you, you're going to see us be able to position that as a big driver of even tourism uh, in the next few months and going through the next few years. That's great. And so for me, it brings me back to you, David. So we're talking about, you know, the innovation that Tim has, you know, has highlighted and how actually, you know, the Western Cape has been actually well positioned because of the innovation that's come through. A lot of these innovative and tech driven businesses are actually showcased at the VNA Waterfront, which for me talk, speaks to the VNA Waterfront being this platform of allowing for, you know, the, the springboard for, for these businesses that come out of the Western Cape and then actually position us quite well for, you know, a future beyond, you know, where we are today. What is your outlook on the level two restrictions in terms of that, the impact on those businesses? And then I also like to hone in in terms of when we talk about the agriculture sector and the agro-processing, immediately we're talking food. And so again, the VNA Waterfront is again, this platform, this showcase, for example, through the restaurants that exists in the precinct. What's your outlook in terms of level two and what that means for our restaurants as well? Yeah, no, um, I think I'll probably start with, with food because I think that's kind of resonates through everybody's um, sort of conversation. I mean, we, we have this incredibly rich culinary um, 
uh, history and, 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 and heritage within, um, within the, the Cape. Um, and I, I think that applies to both um, product and, and to, to restaurants. So one of the things um, we're looking to, to encourage is we're, we're opening up um, an initiative called the a Kitchen Incubator. So what we've identified is that there's a gap um, for businesses who've got a, a product idea or a restaurant idea, if you take the restaurant idea, to have the restaurant idea to cook for people, but actually to go from that to having a lease, bricks and mortar and all this kind of investment um, is, is huge. So we came across this idea of kitchen incubator in, in uh, San Francisco and Amsterdam. And what it is, you, you, you create a, a shared common kitchen. We've been, we're introducing a, a cohort program where people who've got the idea can apply and they'll go in a six month intensive program. And then after that, they'll be able to do pop up, a pop up restaurant. So very low capital investment um for them and an idea to kind of get their product to market and i think that's that's what we've been trying to do is, is searching for different um, ways in, into market there um, would that be the maker's landing that we've been seeing launched yeah. In media yeah that's that that would be that would be the maker's landing one yeah um i think just i mean just picking up I mean, when when the, the place is going to when thing under lockdown two when things are going to open up um, you know, you're always looking internationally, and internationally, you know, we we saw, as Lulu's referred to, the the tourism, the summer tourism. I think we all hoped that that tourism would have been a success, and it would have been a kind of model. But unfortunately, it, it, they've stuttered. Now, there's learning from that, but they really have kind of stuttered in, in opening back up, and and they've kind of re reversed a little bit. So I think we'll we're gonna we have to learn from that. Um, but one of the encouraging things I, I picked up was, and usually, I mean, at the height of COVID, you know, cruise line traffic. Um, cruise, going on a cruise liner must be almost at like the antithesis. Um, they, they've got a terrible reputation, people got kind of stranded. Um, but these businesses have changed and innovated. Um, and uh, last week, um, cruise lining around Italy, so as a, as a country, Italy, um, said we're going to allow cruise liners to actually tour the coast and, and pick up. So I think that's an example where the, where the innovation and, and, and uh, the tourism has, has kind of picked up and recovered faster. Yeah, and that's incredibly encouraging considering that at some point Italy was sort of this Armageddon of COVID-19. So it's good to see that there is a yeah. way out of this. We can pivot around it and we can find a new way to work with these things. And so that's right. not, this is not the end. This is actually- no, absolutely, absolutely not. And, 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 and Tim, correctly said, you know, pre-COVID, <clears throat> what we were seeing was quite a, a very encouraging growth. And I mean, on the cruise, which we, we operate the cruise terminal, you know, we were seeing about 50,000 passengers. Then we had confirmed bookings pre-COVID of 200,000, and the future was going up to 300,000. So it was going to be a very significant part of the business. And I, 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 I do think there's a, these businesses will respond, they'll adapt. In fact, what the cruise liners are talking about from being, you know, places people would be almost frightened to go, they're saying, well, actually, effectively, we're an island. So we can, like New Zealand, we can control who comes in and who um, leaves. So they're, they're sort of turning almost to their advantage to say we can actually offer up a safer destination that we're controlling um, this, this island. Um, so I, I, I think we should keep optimistic um, that there is innovation and creativity um, we're seeing that, that hopefully will lead to a more rapid return. Yeah, yeah. And so, Lulu, I mean, you know, bringing back from what David was talking about in terms of, for example, the Maker's Landing, that actually effectively is actually a form of, you know, an expanded form of relief for our SME sector, which is this idea that we've come up with an idea that not only is it about growing businesses, but it's actually going to drive our recovery. From your point of view, what are the relief sort of packages and initiatives are you seeing that maybe our entrepreneurs need to know about that aren't necessarily specific to tourism or the VNA waterfront or the Western Cape, but where can our entrepreneurs start looking to find out that this is, this is the notion, this is the avenue to follow in terms of finding relief? Yeah, I think there's, there's a couple of, of central government initiatives that obviously has been uh, announced and, and I think most people are aware of that. Um, you know, if you look at, at TERS, the UIF, I mean, that's, that's been, there's been a lot of, of interest there. Um, unfortunately, as far as I know, that is running out in, in September. Um, and then, of course, there's been uh, the Solidarity Fund, 
uh, but also have been oversubscribed. But interestingly enough, um, I've spoken to some of the players in the banking sector and um, that initiative, uh, the loan guarantee scheme that's been announced uh, where, you know, a lot of smaller businesses and medium sized businesses can actually apply. Um, apparently the tech up there has not been as as big as they thought and it's been slower and it would be interesting to hear from you know the people on the ground the the SMEs and the and the and the middle and medium sized businesses as to why that's the case um, as has it been um, slow processing um, of applications or applications not going in I actually spoke to one of the people that designed um, part of this uh, process and they say that they think that a lot of businesses are weary of taking on additional debt you know they, they first want to try and figure out things on their own and they see that as potentially uh, taking up additional debt but um, that's interestingly been one of the areas where um, where there has not been a lot of movement um, again as I said as before I say we've been uh, engaging with government with SARS around some of the tax relief um, initiatives that we've been seeing, but also around you know longer term options that's available and where um, instead of necessarily providing additional funding or, or companies feeling that they are taking on additional debt onto their balance sheets, are there other ways that we can support them uh, in terms of access to market, in terms of regulation? And so on, um, and and I think that is one of the things that that we are driving uh, very hard uh, through the B4SA initiatives to say, yes, there's there's support, but also what other things can we do to just change the operating environment and make it easier uh, for some of these businesses? But if there's anybody that's on on the line that has maybe um, made use of any of these initiatives that's been, um, you know announced by government, it would be very interesting to get their perspectives as to how successful it's been. Um, we've heard, you know, with the terse payments from the UIF that there's been a, you know, a lot of frustration from people. And even if you look at the Solidarity Fund, um, uh, there's, there's been some frustrations here and there. So it would be good to understand maybe, you know, what their experience has been. And, and then specifically, as I said, what's very interesting to me is that the banks and, and some of the players in the market that's involved in the loan guarantee scheme has said to, to us that the uptake there has not been as, as big as they, as they thought it would be. Sure. And Tim, so perhaps from your point of view at the helm of a trade and investment promotion agency, what's been your experience and your view? Because obviously we've received a lot of feedback from the entrepreneurs who are trying to access some of these relief initiatives. What is your experience and what feedback are you receiving as West Grow? And perhaps what advice can you offer our entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think this has been one of the, the more difficult parts of, of navigating the crisis from South Africa. You know, you saw quite extraordinary support extended uh, in Europe and in the US. Uh, essentially, the, U the European position was they were going to spend whatever it took to support their economy. Obviously, we have very different financial realities here. And what you ended up with, particularly in the early days of the crisis, was, was some support, but very much scattered across different um, uh, sources in government. Um, and our, our response was to, to, to build a way of helping companies to, to identify which support they should be applying for. It, that, that, that is actually still live. If they are uh, small businesses on the call who, who, who want to see what supports on offer, I suggest they go to our site supportbusiness.coza, which we, we set up in conjunction with the city and the province and the, and the other agencies. That's been live for six months. Uh, on there is a, what we call the support finder tool. You have to put in five questions, the answers to five questions rather, um, takes five minutes. Um, and so far, 7,000 companies have used that tool. Uh, all they, they have about 80,000 employees, and the vast majority of those are very small businesses with a, a revenue or turnover of under 5 million. So um, we, that's a clearly an indication of demand for support, and, and we just thought we would try and, and make it easier for small businesses to access that support. Um, and I think that's still relevant for some companies uh, today. Uh, incidentally, you know, financial support is one element of this. But frankly, just navigating the, the changing regulations of the lockdown is, is a big problem for many businesses as well. So you'll find almost 250 
answers to frequently asked questions that we update kind of hourly on there. And that'll tell you exactly what you can and can't do uh, under this level of the lockdown. So for example, how do you apply to work beyond the curfew of 10 o'clock? It's an interesting question. It's answered on the site along with 240 or so other, other questions. So uh, I hope that that's, that effort on that platform, supportbusiness.coza, is, um, is sort of indicative of the way we've, we've joined up with our partners to try and help business navigate the lockdown. And certainly that'll be the same approach we take uh, as we try and drive a strong recovery together. Yeah, that's very valuable because I think it's not so much that entrepreneurs don't know that there's help. It's just about knowing what appropriate help and where do I find the help. So I think support.co.za is really, really helpful. And I, I'm, I know we've dropped some information in the chat box for or in the Q&A box for our um, audience. And of course, if you ever need extra information to our audience, please be sure to email the SMME help desk to be able to, you know, get your answers, question, um, your questions answered correctly. And of course, as quickly as is possible. We're getting some feedback, Lulu, from what you'd mentioned in terms of asking, posing the question to our audience. And so what I can share with you is that we understand that many businesses are reluctant to take on additional debt because there's economic uncertainty. So we're hoping that perhaps with level to opening up, perhaps businesses will now start understanding or maybe feeling more certain for that, you know, the idea of being able to access, you know, additional debt if they need to. But to Tim's point, it's not always about accessing financing, but it's actually accessing information and know-how. Um, I know somebody's also mentioned that the loan guarantee fund from one of the banks was been very, very difficult for them to access and therefore they proved to be unsuccessful in their endeavor with that. So these are the realities that exist for our entrepreneurs. And so, you know, David, what, what advice would you give from your point of view at, you know, at the helm of then what is, you know, the precinct, but actually it's also a convening agent. You convene entrepreneurs, you convene customers, you convene clients, um, and effectively you also convene innovation. So what advice would you be able to provide to our entrepreneurs on this call as they look forward? Yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. Um, <clears throat> And the assistance that, that people can get, where they can source it, and, and, and like um, Westgrow, we've we have um, tried to to assist and work at where the kind of pinch points are, and and the experience that is reflected is is that um, one you know people don't want to take on debt with quite onerous interest accumulation, we still have pretty high interest rates here, um, but secondly, it's, it's very complex. So we've tried um, as a waterfront to uh, provide this kind of um, um, online consultancy assistance with, with people in, in their applications, but um, I think last I looked, we'd, we'd assisted about 60 applications and only five of them had actually um, come through. So the, um, Lulu mentioned the, the um, UIF terrors and you know, high success rate, over 90% of, of people have managed to get that. But the, the, other, the other assistance is, is actually proving to be quite sort of Quite sort of complex um, in there, so you know I think it's 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 a, it's probably a question maybe for the the audience. Um, you know, we I think all of us have tried to put together packages. Um, I think the final one we've 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 got a bit of flexibility, and we have understood that um, to reopen people need working capital. So we've set a scheme um, up where we will advance that working capital um, interest free. Um, just so that so that people can can then open up with our with our with our tenants because uh, so it's a much much less onerous um, obligation to them and, 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 our, and our feeling was that if we didn't kind of step into this gap that um, they, they just they just would not be able to reopen they'd survive but they were unable to kind of reopen so we we have that that support is is available within 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 the waterfront but it you know I think it's 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 what more um, what what would be more effective. We, we've set up um, quite a few things, but it would be very interesting to hear from the audience what, the, what their, their thoughts were on, on what would be the most effective way of, of assisting. Of course, and so to our audience, you can direct your feedback to the help um, desk, which is SMME help desk at waterfront.co.za, SMME help desk 
at waterfront.co.za. And so we're going to end our webinar very soon. And so I'm wondering if each of our panelists just has a parting shot for us, given where we are and you know, what can we leave our entrepreneurs with who've been on this webinar with us. Lulu, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, I think um, what, you said, what we need to, what we all understand is that this is probably, you know, one of the most difficult economic times that most of us um, will have to deal with. Um, we we haven't been through anything like this, and I, and I think we need to realize that it is it is going to be tough. But I think if there's one thing um, that that I've seen through all of this, um, it's just how um, how flexible people are, how uh, we can work around certain things, and you know, especially entrepreneurs and, and SMMEs. Um, I, I've had so many discussions with, with a lot of entrepreneurs and SMMEs over the years where they've said that, you know, we tend to find a way around things and we need to, you know, we tend to, to be creative and, and much more responsive. And I think that's where SMMEs probably have um, a leg up um, if, over a lot of the big corporates out there and, you know, the big businesses in terms of their agility and ability to respond and ability to make decisions. You know, if you just think about some of the big corporates, how long you sometimes take for them to be able to, to change their business models. And, and um, that, that means that, you know, these opportunities that might pass them by. So I think that's the one thing that I suppose that is, is really um, encouraging. You mentioned right at the beginning um, us, leapfrogging certain of these things. There's a lot of trends that started before COVID. If you look at things like digitalization around uh, the green economy and sustainability and us moving, uh, you know, towards that. And um, I think what, what COVID has done is just pushed that forward and has necessitated us to take that on a lot quicker. And um, I think that, that we should, Yes, that is caught us unawares, I think, in a lot of instances, but we should also, you know, take take comfort from the fact that um, we were able and we are able to respond and how uh, flexible people are. I suppose where the, where the difficult things come, come in is sometimes in terms of planning and understanding what people's behavior would be. And, and that's a tricky thing for us at the moment is to, to know how customers, how tourists are going to respond over the next couple of months. Right. Thank you, Lulu. Thank you for your time. Tim, parting shot from you. Yeah, three things to end from me. Picking up on Lulu's point, I want to reflect on resilience. Um, we spoke a lot about resilience in Cape Town before many other places because we all went through the drought. Uh, and I think uh, we're an example to many cities around the world that are facing climate change. Many of us are sitting in Cape Town now and it's raining very hard right now, filling the dams. But more importantly, we're no longer as vulnerable as, as we were to drought because we've diversified the sources of water. And more importantly, we've all changed our relationship with uh, water as, as citizens, and that's a sustained change. So that, that is a, a, an example of resilience uh, of a, where we faced a crisis together and got through it. And this is the next one now. Um, if you look at the health response by the provincial government in the Western Cape, it must be one of the uh, best practices globally in the developing world. Uh, I've spoken to our major investors uh, over the past few weeks who all reflect on that as being part of the reason why they chose to invest in the Cape in the first place. Um, so even though there are, there's real stories of, of, um, of loss and, and challenge and difficulty in this time, we are an inherently resilient economy because we're used to dealing with challenges and, and now the whole world is dealing with this one alongside us. But uh, certainly, what, what you find particularly in smaller businesses in the restaurant trade is a huge resilience overall in the category. You know, when 9-11 when happened, people predicted that was the end of New York's restaurant scene. Uh, there were 20,000 restaurants in New York before that uh, incident, and today there's 26,000. So we bounce back. We, we, we are resilient as a sector, and certainly tourism and, and, and hospitality will be back. Um, equally, I, 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 or rather, I also want to talk about remote work versus physical work. Remote work is, I think, something that many companies have now just adopted as part of their business practice. But the challenge 
in the next few weeks, I think will be get back will be to get back to safe face-to-face -face work, so, uh, face-to-face -face meetings, uh, office work, uh, interactions where we're safely able to uh, respect COVID protocols but get back to face-to-face -face productivity. And, and I think for the Cape, we, we will always now manage those two, remote work and face-to-face -face work. Um, the challenge is getting back quickly to face-to-face -to -face work because a, a significant part of our economy requires it. Um, and I think you're seeing a lot of pent-up demand. We, we, we tracked the travel start uh, ticket bookings as level two was announced. Uh, over the weekend and between 8.30 and 9 when the announcement was made there were 320 flights booked from Joburg to Cape Town so that's people who are sitting there hovering over the buy button to buy their ticket people are keen to travel again to get back into physical meetings and then lastly I just wanted to reflect on the upside of remote work for Cape Town and the Western Cape you know one way of thinking about work from home is actually work from anywhere and, and when you have a really desirable destination like Cape Town, you, we can position ourselves as a working location for people from all around the world who might have thought to visit here as a, as a, for a holiday, but will now say, hang on, why don't I stay for a few months and, and, and work from Cape Town? So if you're looking for long, longer term, really exciting opportunities in the competitive destination marketing space. That's, that's certainly one that we're focused on. And I think that will help to drive a strong recovery and a return to growth and jobs here in the Cape. That's really exciting because of course, more people coming into work and stay for a longer time means more customers and clients for our businesses. David, a parting shot from you, knowing that we've got just a few minutes before we wrap up. <laughs> Yeah, um, everything uh, Lou and Tim have said resonates. Yeah, just, uh, two things. One, I think on mental health, um, you know, be very aware this has been extraordinary circumstances. Um, and, and kind of, um, you know, focus on, on what is strategically where you want to be, how we want to come out of this. Um, but also be aware of your filter, of filtering things out. There's a lot of bad news. Um, I'm, I'm very strong, you know, we actually don't know. So when somebody says that we think international travel will be 40% down in three years' time, that, you get incredibly depressed with it. But then you say, well, there's actually no basis for that. So kind of uh, be aware your mental health is, is affected and, and, try and, and try and sort of bring in filters. Um, um, the, I, I'm in South Africa because of this, uh, this can-do, this resilience, this innovation and creativity, and, and, and that's what I love. And, and, and you're seeing that kind of coming through. And I think the final thing, you know, under, lock, under lockdown two, um, one of the big positives is that these attractions, Zeitz Mocker Museum, the aquarium, the red bus, what they're doing is they're just taking kind of baby steps um, and they're starting to come back. And I think that's the, you know, that's the, the way they're, for a few people, there is a silver bullet. They've pivoted their business. They've gone online, they've got this fantastic order, but it's a tiny minority. For most people, it's just trying experimenting, taking baby steps, surviving and moving through. But uh, that's where, uh, what's what I love about working in the Western Cape and Cape Town, this kind of creativity, innovation, and resilience. It's part of the DNA of South Africans. But that being said, it's a great way for us to end this webinar, I think, forced by my internet. Um, for everyone else, please understand that we've got another web webinar waiting for us on the 6th of September, and they will be focusing on the health of safety protocols as we move into level two restrictions here in South Africa. Thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you so much for the advice, the insights, and of course, the, the hopeful, you know, gaze that we have towards the future. Thank you to everyone to, for joining our learning lunch. We'll see you next time. Remember, we have a recording of this, so be able, you'll be able to share this with your teams. Stay safe, stay positive, stay COVID negative. Goodbye.